Welcome everyone to this panel on the rise of restrictions on data flows and digital technologies. We are recording this panel on March 4th at 9.30 a.m. Eastern time with panelists distributed all over the world. And I hope you will enjoy watching our discussion during this virtual annual meeting of the American Society of International Law. I understand there will be a continue the conversation possibility. We are all very much looking forward to continuing the conversation during the annual meeting. My name is Thomas Strines. I'm the Executive Director of Gurini Global Law and Tech at NYU School of Law. And I'm very grateful to ASIL for putting this important topic on the agenda and for assembling such a stellar panel. I will briefly introduce the panelists uh, and then provide a brief introduction into the topic before we will jump into the conversation. Uh, I have with me on this virtual stage Ambassador George Mina, who is the Australian representative to the World Trade Organization, where he's one of the co-conveners on the negotiations of, uh, on e-commerce. Uh, also with us is Maria Martin Prat, who is a director at DG Trade in the European Commission, where she works on Asia, services and digital trade, investment and intellectual property. Yan Luo is a partner in Covington and Burling's Beijing office, where she advises clients on a broad range of regulatory matters, in particular on data privacy, cybersecurity, antitrust, and trade in a number of jurisdictions. And finally, we have with us Professor Sarah Barley Dansman, who is a professor of international studies at the Hamilton Luger School of Global and International Studies at the Indiana University Bloomington. And she's an expert on the political economy of international investment and finance, and also um, uh, does research on national security investment and global networks of ownership and production. So we'll see, we've put together here a panel that um, is uniquely positioned to shed light on crucial questions um, on the rise of uh, restrictions on data flows and digital technologies and how international law might respond to them. It, it might almost seem trite to stress the importance of digital data as a source for information and knowledge, as an economic asset, in particular for artificial intelligence and machine learning, and as a medium through which goods and services are increasingly being provided in the global economy. But it is not right, because after all, our discussion today depends on data flows and interconnectivity that the internet enables and wouldn't be possible without a platform such as Zoom. And as data is rising in importance as, as a commodity, as a source of information, and as a medium through which the global uh, the global digital economy functions, it's also quickly becoming a very important and controversial topic in international law. The WTO is engaged in plurilateral e-commerce negotiations. The United States has advanced its digital trade agenda through agreements such as initially the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, then the US-Mexico-Canada Agreement, and uh, finally the US-Japan Digital Trade Agreement. But at the same time, it has resorted to unusually restrictive measures through the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. The European Union um, lacks the big tech companies that US and China has, but it has emerged as a global regulatory power with uh, something that Anne Bradford has conceptualized as the Brussels effect, and its GDPR has been uh, seen as a model for data protection laws around the world, despite its restrictions on, on data flows that gave rise to the Schrems II decision last summer that called into question whether transatlantic data flows of personal data could continue. And the recent negotiations between the EU and the United Kingdom on a Brexit deal gave, uh, uh, gave new rise to discussions about the ways in which international economic law might need to frame these conversations around personal data flows. And finally, there's China emerging uh, uh, global digital superpower, in particular in, on artificial intelligence, with a very elaborate data governance regime and huge investments along the digital Silk Road, which um, recently joined the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, which also includes an e-commerce chapter. So there's a lot of activity in international law, in particular in international economic law. And we will discuss today how all these developments might fit together and whether there's a need to craft new rules and in which venues these new rules might come about. And to do that, I will hand it over to our experts on this panel. We will start with Ambassador uh, George Mina, for, followed by Maria Martin Pratt, Jan Luo, and Sarah Bauli Dansman, and they will give us a quick sense of their perspectives on these important topics before we will transition towards a discussion. Uh, Ambassador Mina, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Thomas, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to such a prestigious group uh, at the ASIL conference. 
a quick snapshot from me on the initiative of the WTO, and then we can go, as you, as you say, to questions. The WTO is engaged at the moment in a project involving 86 countries, 86 members, to create new global digital trade standards through something that's known as the e-commerce joint statement initiative. Uh, and it is, you asked at the start of your presentation, is there a need for international economic lawmaking and in which venues? We believe there is a need to promote growth, innovation, and we believe the WTO is a pretty good venue. It's almost universal, of course, in its, uh, in its approach, and there's, as I say, 86 members involved in this project. Governments are recognising they need to rise to the challenge presented by the global digital transformation, and that is particularly the case through uh, this last 12 months. Uh, and they're recognising as well that they need to deal with some of those core social values that we're all dealing with in our own domestic jurisdictions, such as privacy and regulation of privacy. So data flows, as you've said already, gr crucial to the global economy uh, and, of course, increasingly important to our social and private lives. Uh, and this is uh, something that has only been uh, emphasised uh, more and more as time goes on, in particular during the COVID crisis, the rise of telecommuting, uh, online service delivery, remote engagement between businesses, international sharing of data uh, in extraordinary volumes, uh, in microseconds, uh, you know, increasingly important to the global economy, uh, artificial intelligence, research, you name it. And data, lo data localization requirements are increasingly uh, both a cost to business and potentially a disincentive to operate across borders. Uh, at the same time, uh, a whole range of considerations uh, in domestic regulatory jurisdictions, so security, privacy, uh, and other, other social concerns. Uh, in our project at the WTO, many countries are calling for strong commitments on data flows and on localization. And there are different regulatory models out there. You've already mentioned the Trans-Pacific Partnership model. You've also already mentioned, I'm sure Maria will talk about this in a minute, the EU's own uh, extraordinary regulatory influence globally. And there are two sites of, uh, of, of influence on this negotiation. Uh, we believe that this big task of being able to reconcile the, the, the huge interest in, in regulation that promotes data flows and some of the concerns that have been raised about the restrictions on data flows, such as privacy. We believe it's, it's doable. We don't think it'll be easy, but we do believe it'll be doable. And the enormous um, uh, interest in this initiative that uh, not only has the US, uh, China, the EU, but a whole range of the WTO membership engaged in it, I think, demonstrates the, uh, the strength and commitment to get it done. I'll leave it there, Thomas, and look forward to, to questions. Thanks a lot for, for the initial statement. So now we heard about the WTO perspective, and I want to give the floor to Maria Martin Pratt to talk about uh, the European Union's perspective on digital trade. Thank you very much, Thomas, and let me also start by thanking the American Society of International Law for the opportunity to, to have this discussion today. I will start by uh, a couple of uh, statements that very much go along what uh, Ambassador Mina just, uh, just expressed, but uh, I think is, is, is the basic framework for our discussions. We know um, data and data flows are essential increasingly for most uh, sectors of the economy. It is often an issue linked to the digital trade, by, but data flows and cross-border flow of data are important not only in services, not only on digital, uh, in digital services, they are essential for the checking of functioning of uh, engines, uh, manufacturing capability, many, many industries, uh, not only in the digital sphere, but uh, more traditional areas of trade uh, increasingly, re re increasingly have to rely on, on, on the free flow of data. Now, this is not an objective, it's a reality. It's something that's been happening uh, for many years in some cases, think of uh, financial services. Um, at the same time, 
what we are seeing increasingly is uh, the raise of obstacles to the free flow of data. And they come in, in many shapes, uh, very often linked to data localization requirement, but it can be also in the shape of prior authorizations uh, in order to be able to uh, transfer data inside or outside a particular jurisdiction. Um, this is a trend that it is worrying, but that clearly um, it is increasing in some jurisdictions. And at the same time, we are all uh, trying to get the right regulation in place for digital trade in general, but also in particular to frame the free flow of data. Uh, a very specific concern that comes is privacy, and that is one that has been at the center of the discussions as regards free flow of data in the European Union. But I think that increasingly, and Thomas, you were referring to it in your presentation, increasingly we're also going to have a discussion about data and security. And indeed, uh, this is something that has been already reflected in the functioning of CFIUS in the United States, or is something that is also reflected in the functioning of the foreign direct investment screening, screening uh, framework in the European Union. So data and privacy, data and security, and then the last element, data as a competitive asset, which is what comes and probably is going to even complicate further uh, the equation, uh, the attempts to make sure data does not leave certain jurisdictions, not because of a concern vis-a-vis -vis privacy or security, but because whoever has data has an advantage on technologies such as artificial intelligence and, and much more. So we are of the view uh, in the European uh, Commission that we do need to, uh, at the same time as in some cases, uh, develop rules at the national or union level, we do need to aim at having uh, an important set of rules at international level. And clearly the WTO uh, is for us central uh, to that effort. Um, we do, and I think that is not a surprise uh, for you, combine on the one hand, uh, a very strong interest to do away with, for instance, unjustified data localization requirements, which as I said, are popping up in a number of jurisdictions, while at the same time, uh, for us, there is a, a principle that constitutes, uh, in our view, uh, a, a standard that we cannot negotiate in trade, uh, which is the protection of rights. I think that uh, the discussion on the protection of personal data privacy is evolving. And whereas maybe two, three, four years ago, the Europeans may have come across as putting these as a principle without, uh, without considering the effects on trade, increasingly you do have now many, many partners that are considering the protection of privacy as a priority, even if it may have an impact on a number of the things that can be, for instance, uh, traded or the data in the manner in which it can flow. Uh, I think it is probably because we have seen the consequences that digital trade and online services may have for the privacy of citizens and the consequences it has in, in, in the bigger framework, which is our society. I will leave it there. Uh, I'm happy then to, to take questions in, in the discussion that, that, that will follow. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So after having heard from Geneva in, in Brussels, we'll move further east and we'll hear from Yen Lu in Beijing, China. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. And um, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to join the uh, esteemed panelists this morning. And thanks for the organizer to have me here. Um, so I think this is absolutely a much needed conversation on data flow and how rules governing cross-border data flows should or would interact with uh, trade and investment laws. So, um, as, as noted in your uh, introduction, um, I'm a practitioner um, on the ground um, um, that we work with both 
uh, multinationals uh, operating in China and also working with a lot of the Chinese companies around the world. So um, I'm closely watching the policy developments around the world. And at the same time that, you know, our task as lawyers is actually to assist those companies to operationalize their uh, quote unquote digital compliance programs um, in China and elsewhere. So, um, so, so, so from our perspective, we see that countries mirror each other uh, in their um, rising scrutiny of data flows, um, either from uh, Europe to China or from, uh, from US to China or the other way around that uh, China out to other jurisdictions. So, um, you know, those scrutiny sometimes come out of the uh, data protection or, or, or cybersecurity security concerns or out of national security concerns. So, um, so we see that efforts from government around the world actually um, sometimes suggest a, a strikingly similar set of concerns. Um, and much of that is rooted um, around the mutual vulnerabilities locked in today's interconnected technological systems. Uh, and, and that's all societies are depending on now. Um, so, so I'm looking forward to um, contribute to today's conversation and bringing a China perspective because uh, we see that the Chinese regulators are both learning from other regulators, more experienced privacy or cyber uh, regulators, uh, but also at the same time are becoming much more assertive in trying to influence uh, future generations of global data governance framework. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it here and i will happy to um, discuss more about what, what's happening in China and, and how we think China might influence the next generation of global rules. Thanks. Thank you, thank you so much. And finally, we'll hear from Professor Barley Densman. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Thomas. And I wanna start again by thanking you for putting together such a fantastic panel. I also want to thank my <clears throat> um, fellow panelists for engaging in such a really interesting, timely, and important conversation, as well as the participants of uh, ASOL, uh, which I'm hoping uh, we can further this conversation when uh, when we uh, present or when this particular pre-recorded session uh, is is goes live for everyone. So I can provide a perspective on this issue of data and digital tech um, restrictions, mostly from a foreign investment regulation and investment screening vantage point. And I wanna make three points here. So the first is, yes, the US probably has the most assertive position on screening foreign investment acquisitions for national security concerns arising from sensitive personal data, which is a bit of a flip from um, when we think about uh, data privacy, where Europe is much stronger in this regard to the US. And in the case of the US, when we look at things like the very public dispute over ByteDance's ownership of TikTok, uh, as well as reporting in the news that the US screening mechanism, the um, Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, or CFIUS, required a Chinese business to divest from um, Grindr, the dating app. But those are very um, kind of high profile examples of um, concrete ways in which the US has become more restrictive when it comes to the ownership of US businesses that collect a lot of uh, sensitive personal data. But I also want to point out that many other advanced economies are expanding their screening authorities to also include data privacy issues. So while this kind of makes news the most in the United States, I don't think that we should think of this as a purely American phenomenon. The second point is that when we think about sensitive personal data from a national security perspective, one of the issues here is that there are many ways in which governments can kind of think about sensitive personal data as uh, creating a national security concern. So one issue has to do with just very broad data collection that can be used for intelligence purposes, especially if there are there's kind of lack of trust about um, whether the business that owns this data is going to protect it from authorities or share it with authorities. 
another issue is targeted data collection that can be used to collect information on things like troop movements or the act activities of diplomats or be used to um, blackmail or recruit government employees as sources. And then another issue, uh, or that, that sort of also kind of connects to concerns about how adversaries could use data to target specific vulnerable groups and particularly dissidents in a diaspora community. Um, so those are sort of the ways I think the kind of very concrete national security uh, ways to think about this issue and potential concerns. But a more challenging component of assessing risk is how data issues intersect with technology issues. So the problem here is that emerging technology and especially AI and biotech and things like that, uh, it, it's very hard to separate those emerging technologies from data because these technologies depend on collecting a lot of data to perfect their algorithms and so forth. And so the issue is that it's incredibly challenging to determine which of these emerging technologies have solely commercial applications and which ones are truly dual use. And so uh, when you, uh, and so because of this, it's very challenging to scope limitations of, on ownership of data um, to, um, uh, ownership of data um, specifically to national security concerns because when everything is potentially military use, then it's really hard to get comfortable with foreign ownership of these, um, of these businesses. And so uh, this intersects with some of the concerns Maria raised about the fact that data is a competitive asset. And so therefore the other thing that's happening here is that these issues around data are not cleanly always national security issues. There's also this kind of economic competitive issue that's very hard to separate out. And finally, because I know I'm short on time, I, um, my third point is that uh, while my expertise lies with investment screening, it's important to contextualize the issue of data and digital tech in a much broader regulatory regime. And so while others have brought up issues around privacy law and shared regulatory expectations around digital trade and digital uh, and, and data lo localization requirements, one other area that I think deserves mention uh, is around information communication technology infrastructure. So here the US's campaign against Huawei is very instructive because it showcases how from a political perspective, governments are increasingly thinking about how network structures provide both opportunities and vulnerabilities when it comes to data flows. And this issue fundamentally is one about trust because you can have very strong privacy laws, but these laws cannot be meaningfully enforced if the infrastructure through which these data um, flow is fundamentally not secure. And so without shared trust that vendors are not misusing their access to networks, then there will be conflict. And so when we think about paths towards more cooperative outcomes internationally, we also need to pay careful attention to how to build trust among these key global actors. So I'll leave it there. Um, and I look forward to uh, a lively back and forth. Thanks so much for, for these in initial statements. We see we have, we have a lot on, on the table. And what I would like to do is to now pose one question to, to each, each panelist to give them an opportunity to go a little bit deeper in, into these issues. And then we'll transition into a discussion uh, uh, on the broader questions, mainly centered on, on security, privacy issues, and how we might arrive at new rules. So I'll uh, go in the same order again. And so my first question will be to, to Ambassador Mina, and is about the plurilateral effort within the WTO. And the question, given that it's a plurilateral effort, is um, how you see the relationship between the Joint Statement Initiative and those countries who are not participating. And India and South Africa in particular have um, issued a communication that suggested that this might break with a certain spirit of multilateralism or even legal principles enshrining such multilateralism. So those are the outliers on, on within the WTO system. And then there's this other question, how you see the WTO interacting with other institutions that are engaged in creating new rules for global digital economy, um, such as the um, OECD, but also um, standard setting bodies and other um, actors that are drafting privacy uh, principles, how, how could those get integrated into the effort that the WTO is engaged in? Mm. No, they're great questions. Thank you, Thomas. And uh, 
can I just say to my panelists, uh, a very rich co-panelists, a very rich set of perspectives. Thank you too. I've learned a lot just listening to to that discussion. But look, on the first point you ask, Thomas, how does this all sit within the multilateral negotiating framework? I think uh, there, I obviously want to acknowledge that there are differences of view about how to drive rulemaking forward at the World Trade Organization. And Australia's view has always been to be pragmatic, to use all opportunities to drive rulemaking, particularly at the moment uh, with the WTO in, in the position it's in, not having registered many wins lately. We need, we need some, some wins. Uh, now, obviously, um, there is a preference uh, among some to drive in the, in the universal, multilateral, all-in, everyone-in mode, and that's, that's, in some members' view, the only way to do rulemaking. That's not our view. Universality is not always the best place to start with global rulemaking efforts. Uh, plurilateral initiatives, I would say, Thomas, have never been uh, uh, novel and they're, ne and they're not revolutionary now in the WTO. In fact, uh, this has been the predominant form of rulemaking in the WTO and, and before that, the GATT architecture. So uh, what we're on about is a project that has broad participation, uh, that plays an important role in in complementing other global liberalisation efforts, such as the sort you mentioned, uh, TPP and other rulemaking that's going on at regional and bilateral levels. We're trying to bring that to the WTO and make sure that we are uh, increasing the level of, of cohesion and the level of, uh, of participation uh, in that rulemaking so that we've got as much uh, 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 consistency and coherence as we can get. Uh, now, more broadly, uh, these efforts on plurilateral rulemaking are also great, gaining gaining some ground here at the WTO. Your second question was about Im improving the engagement with other stakeholders, and I think that's very important. It is important that we understand, and I think others have referred to this, that that rulemaking on on all elements of the of the cyber world, digital trade, uh, ethics, uh, some of the cybersecurity questions, uh, some of the tech questions. There's many, many fora out there globally, and it's important that we are engaging with all of those efforts and, and making sure there is some degree of communication and cohesion uh, and coherence between them. Now, that means here at the WTO we need to be more responsive, more open to stakeholder engagement. It means business, other stakeholders, NGOs, those concerned, citizens that are concerned with questions such as those we've heard about, privacy, are able to engage in the rulemaking effort and the rulemaking process, and that's certainly our commitment with Japan and Singapore as co-conveners to the management of this uh, uh, of this initiative. Look, I think that's probably all you need from me at this stage and leave it to others to uh, to tackle some of the other hard questions you're going to throw at them. Yeah, th thanks a lot. Um, and I think we'll come back to some of these themes also in, in the discussion um, towards the end. But before... Uh, we go there, I would like to, to ask Maria to expand a little bit on how the EU's thinking about what kind of rules should or could be included in trade agreements um, ha has evolved. I, I mentioned earlier the EU-UK trade and cooperation agreement that, that seems to have new language there. And if you maybe could also say a little bit about the way in which this question fits into the trade thinking, because you alluded to in your initial statement to the fact that data is in a way may relate to trade in goods, it may relate to trade in services, it may, might be conceptualized as a digital product, but maybe we could or should break out of these conceptualizations and think about data differently as, as, a, as a kind of fourth category on which rules are being, being developed. So, so that's the conceptual question and the concrete question is how the EU's framework of, of rules, of horizontal rules on data flows and data localization has developed. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think um, our position has been uh, very clear now for uh, over two years. Uh, we, we did have a intensive uh, discussion that resulted in, in a position that we have been uh, tabling in negotiations and, and defending since 2018. That doesn't mean that you are not open uh, to discuss with others with different approaches and to try to find 
uh, language that addresses concerns. And, and we do share one objective with, I think, all of our uh, credit partners, which is to try to ensure we prohibit and justify data localization requirements or obstacles to the free flow of data uh, that uh, are imposed for purposes uh, that are other than um, those justified by, for instance, the protection of, of, of privacy. Uh, it is difficult, and I think some of the interveners were, were, were referring to the fact of, of, of the challenge of sometimes making a difference between what it is uh, an economic objective and what is a security objective or a privacy objective. But we believe that it is possible on the one hand to try to address those obstacles that are unjustified, but at the same time to ensure that uh, we can continue, for us it's a fundamental right, we can continue to ensure the highest possible level of protection to personal data, which for us, it comes to something quite simple. We protect personal data and we want to ensure that when personal data travels, the protection travels with that personal data. And that is the whole system that you have uh, in the GDPR that uh, relies on adequacy decisions, but also in alternative means, because we are perfectly aware of the fact that we do not have adequacy decisions with many countries in the world. There are means to ensure that protection. And, and that is something that has been made clearer in the uh, drafting that has been included now in the UK uh, Trade and Cooperation Agreement. But, but, but the, the substance of the position is exactly the same. We are trying with that language to capture uh, obstacles to the free flow of data, including localization requirements, frankly, for economic reasons, while preserving the possibility to have the rules that we need to protect privacy. Um, now, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll have similar discussions as we go uh, forward in uh, the discussions on this issue in the context of WTO plurilateral negotiations on, on e-commerce. How do we place this debate uh, in, in a broader discussion as to services, trading services, or more generally digital trade? I will avoid getting too much in semantics. Maybe I'm uh, a bit too traditional, but I, I can recognize something called goods. I can recognize something called services. The concept of digital product, which is not new. Eh? I mean, we've been discussing that for a long time. I and mean, software products, software and service is not new. It does have consequence in law in many areas from taxation to copyright to trade. Uh, but we believe that in, for instance, in the context of the uh, e-commerce negotiations in WTO, but the same thing applies to our chapters on digital trade in, in, in our bilateral agreements. What, what we need is to have the rules you need that allow trade that might be digital trade understood as from the beginning to the end of the provision of the service just by online means that can be the provision of services or the manufacturing of goods that relies as well in digital means there are many ways to look into this uh, and, and when you look at the set of uh, disciplines that have been discussed in the context of WTO, say for instance, as regards the recognition of the value of digital signatures or of uh, contracts concluded online, those are important whether you're talking about services or whether you're talking about the conclusion of a contract related to the buying of, of, uh, of goods. So we do tend to get into some of these discussions as soon as you start discussing in WTO, uh, in particular when you go to digital products, but I hope we can we can jump over the, that obstacle and, and be pragmatic. Thanks so much. Um, so, so now I want, want to turn to, to Jan Lu and, and, and to ask you to talk, tell us a little bit more about how companies navigate um, China's data governance regime, and in particular, the different kinds of data localization requirements um, that, that, that exist in China. That, of course, dovetails a little bit with the conversation we've had so far in which data localization has been invoked and 
uh, distinctions were made between justifiable data localization and unjustifiable data localization. So I would uh, invite you to talk more about your perspective on the data localization issue as you see it in China. And in, in, in an extension of that question to maybe also tell us a little bit more about the legislative and rulemaking processes in, in China and um, the extent to which um, there might be a shifting attitude in China vis-a-vis -vis the use of extraterritorial uh, extra jurisdiction as a way of regulating in the digital economy, something that the EU has done for a while in, in, under the GDPR that applies irrespective of where data is stored or being processed as long as you are providing goods and, and services to the European market. Is there a shift in thinking about territoriality as a way of regulating data underway in China? So that would be my, my second question, the, sec the first one on data localization from a practitioner's perspective. Sure. Um, thanks. This is a great question. So um, I'm, I'm happy to discuss what's going on in China. And I like to actually start by saying that the rules about data localization and cross-border data transfer are still um, uh, pending finalization in China. So, um, so, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that to say, you know, how uh, there's uh, many uh, much more uh, deliberations um, in China uh, among the regulators and industries to to actually see how we can finalize those, uh, you know, data localization. And, and transfer requirements. So even for China, that's a huge task, and uh, and we still haven't, um, we're still not there yet to see our final transfer rules out. Uh, so 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 just to say that, you know, just to clarify, because a lot of you know um, our clients asking us constantly, um, you know, can we still transfer data now? Are uh, we required to uh, localize all of our data in China? Um, and our answer is that you know, with a few exceptions in in specific sectors, uh, cross-border data transfer um, is, is largely unrestricted today. So that might be a surprising answer to many. Um, but but um, we're also gonna touch upon it, it is that with the framework that will be final, will likely to be finalized in 2021 or, or next year uh, with the draft personal information protection law. Um, you know, we, we actually expect companies will need to consider their China transfer start strategies very soon. So they have to rethink it. Um, so, so I like to sort of go back to, um, you know, with that background, I'd like to go back a little bit in, in like in, in terms of history. Um, so when the cybersecurity law took effect in June 2017, um, it already had a, a provision on the book to say that, um, you know, they, they, it actually imposed some data localization requirements on the operators of critical information infrastructure. Uh, but but uh, three years on, uh, those restrictions have yet to be fully implemented in practice. Uh, so that's why we say that for most of the companies in China, uh, the data transfer is still unrestricted now. Um, but they, um, you know, in, in 2020, uh, we saw the first draft of the personal information protection law has been issued and they're out for public comments. Um, so, and, and once that law is enacted, uh, it will likely bring a much more comprehensive data transfer framework. Um, as a result of that, uh, we will we expect to see that the requirements companies will be facing will be depend on both the types of data to be transferred and also the status of the data exporter. Uh, for example, if the data exporter is designated as an um, operator of critical information infrastructure, it may face different and uh, enhanced requirements than other companies. Uh, but that's uh, many of the details are still um, uh, are still being under discussion and hasn't been finalized. So, so we can see sort of you know the, the the framework of something that is taking shape, but we haven't we don't know we don't have all the details yet. So that's that's why um, um, on that on the one hand you know we're 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 glad you know a lot of the companies are glad to see that you know China is not insisting on um, you know all the companies uh, localizing their data, uh, but also. On the other hand, you know, this also uh, bring a lot of uncertainties uh, to companies in terms of how to comply uh, with 
future loss, um, as a lot of them see that China is a massive market for them, and then also a, a, a high growth market. So they're uh, sort of you know wanted to make sure that they can comply, and some of the uh, infrastructure decisions cannot be be made uh, you know uh, overnight. Um, so, so, so that's sort of where we are in China. Um, I wanted to mention that, you know, over the past few years, uh, as I said before, that even within China, there's a lot of discussions internally among the industry, among the regulator uh, to see, you know, what, what is the right type of, um, of uh, data localization requirements that we should impose uh, on the national security, pers- from a national security perspective, and also what data should uh, should be, um, uh, you know, sh- should be restricted from leaving China, or should be subject to enhanced review uh, from leaving China. And and I just wanted to say that um, you know, uh, being a, a, a being a, a digital economy superpower uh, with a vibrant uh, digital industry um, uh, at home, uh, China has been quite cautious in terms of uh, you know uh, what kind of uh, restrictions that it wanted to impose on data flows. Uh, um, part of the reason is also that they are also um, want to avoid uh, that uh, backfire uh, to restrict the uh, operation of many of those uh, Chinese uh, high tech companies overseas. So, uh, so it's a, it's a hard question um, to get it right. Uh, we are seeing that China is moving um, on the road to sort of, you know, having a, a more comprehensive rules. Uh, but I have to say that China is not still not there. Um, that that's sort of a good segue to your second question on how what's the rule make rule making process. Um, so um, so so in, in China. Um, there, there's, uh, you know, there's uh, laws that will um, usually need three readings and also uh, will be issued several drafts to be commented by, uh, by, 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 by public. And uh, many multinationals in China has been actively providing comments to the regulators in terms of what kind of rules uh, that would work and, and what, will, what, what was their experience in other jurisdictions. And also we see many Chinese companies Companies are sort of voice their concerns to to the um, uh, to the Chinese regulators directly. Uh, so there's also um, you know a lot of influence, a lot of inputs from the industry uh, to to the regulators. And and on the final question about the um, about the uh, 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 extra turtle. Uh, effect of of Chinese law. Um, I wanted to mention that um, that you know y- y- you're absolutely right that we see this shift uh, from uh, from being quite uh, limited in terms of uh, you know the the extraterritorial effect of those laws to a much more assertive position to say that. Um, to say that Chinese laws will apply just like uh, wherever the Chinese data will travel, it's it's probably this quite similar stand as as GDPR says. Um, in fact, uh, the the um, uh, the most recent draft of the uh, Personal Information Protection Law uh, says that you know this law will apply uh, to the processing of China, personal information um, conducted outside of China. Uh, so if the purpose of the processing is is to provide products or services to individuals in China, to analyze or assess the behavior of individuals in China or for other purposes required by laws and regulations, I'm quoting here. Uh, so as you can see, that probably sounds a lot like GDPR. Um, so uh, that's that's what we say that the, the Chinese regulators, uh, you know, in the past few years, um, although they are pretty young, uh, they are they are learning actively from from other more experienced regulators in the world, but also uh, becoming uh, increasingly more confident and assertive in terms of you know how the Chinese laws should apply uh, not only in China but also around the world. So I hope this uh, helps a little bit. But uh, but you know this is a continued conversation. Yeah, definitely. It's so from uh, one digital superpower to to the other. Let me return to. Uh, Sarah and ask her about her take on the political economy in, um, in the United States and on the geopolitical view. So the way I would phrase the question would be to um, ask you to tell us a little bit more about how the digital economy in the United States, how domestic and multinational corporations 
are reacting to this new environment in which um, investment screening and investment restrictions are being imposed. And to the extent you can, whether you, you could put that into the geopolitical um, context and um, maybe assess to what extent this was um, a, a Trump era initiative um, that might now be on the way out, um, or whether this uh, kind of approach to restrict uh, to restrictions on 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 investment that take data as, as one reason to restrict investments might uh, continue under the Biden administration. Certainly, thank you, and and I've really enjoyed hearing um, all of the other panelists' very detailed. Uh, responses to your questions. I've been learning a lot as I've been uh, listening in. So I think on the kind of political economy and what's happening at the firm level in the United States, one of the things that I find really fascinating about investment screening politics is that there's far less pushback from the um, domestic business community and then I would expect, I think that then many uh, political economists would expect. Uh, where we do see pushback is on the, I don't wanna get too, too technical uh, because I'm sure that not everyone wants to hear all of the nitty gritty on, on FIRMA, the new uh, legislation that strengthened CFIUS. But, where there is kind of concern from the business community is when we get down to the level of non-controlling, non-passive investment and the screening of that. Uh, and a lot of the concerns there is that the enhanced review um, kind of down to that level of non-control is scoped largely to the three areas uh, uh, of business activities that the US government is kind of most um, focused on from a national security perspective. So that's critical technology, critical infrastructure and sensitive personal data. And of course, when you get to the sensitive personal data, oftentimes uh, the critical technologies and the sensitive personal data can sometimes uh, overlap, but not always. And so there are some concerns at that level that when you're screening uh, kind of venture capital, when you're screening at these low levels of investment, that there is concern among the business community that uh, this might create really binding financial constraints. And so scoping these sorts of review mechanisms so that they, um, that they allow the government the ability to review potentially concerning transactions, but that they don't do this in a way that really slows down the engine of growth in the economy, which is innovation, right? Uh, and being able to finance that innovation is, is incredibly important. So it's a, it's a balancing act. And um, I think that there's gonna be more there um, to explore kind of moving forward in terms of how the US government um, kind of interacts with the business community and in particular, the um, emerging tech community over these issues. In terms of what I expect to happen in, an, in a Biden administration, I think that the national security concerns that have driven bipartisan um, strengthening of investment security review in the United States will continue. Remember that FIRMA, that um, legislation that strengthened CFIUS was probably one of the only bipartisan bills that passed under the Trump administration, right? So, and, and broadly bipartisan. So this is not, um, I think that it's very easy to think of the Trump administration and its uh, how it handled the US-China relationship as being kind of very outside of the norm. And it was outside of the norm in terms of strategy and tactics, but not in terms of the underlying concerns at hand. So I do expect that we will see more of the, oh, I, I, I expect that the, the Biden administration will continue to pursue um, a policy that is going to be tough on China, but from a different perspective and one in which the administration will try to be more um, multilateral in terms of bringing in allies and partners along the way. Uh, you, you know, this is a very challenging area to discuss in such a short period of time. 
Um, I would say that from my perspective, there are real concerns, both in terms of, I mean, we didn't even really talk about human rights, which is in the title of this um, panel, but there are real human rights concerns when we are talking about, um, when we're talking about uh, a uh, particular regime that has very concerning human rights uh, ab ab abuses and, and, and record um, that is tied specifically to how data is collected on individuals and a, uh, and a legal structure in which a government that doesn't have much in the way of judicial review can basically pull in all sorts of data um, on all sorts of people without any real kind of insight into what they're doing with that data. And so there are real concerns on that issue, uh, as well as there are real concerns on, on other issues related to how, um, how Chinese-based companies, even if they are not directly state-owned, are, um, are oftentimes supported in ways that are unfair, uh, as opposed to other, as opposed to um, the businesses and companies coming from other countries that don't have receive those same supports. So there are real concerns here. Of course, the other issue is that the US China relationship is really important to get right um, because these are the two, the, the, these two powers plus the European Union are the, you know, the, the big players, the, the biggest um, economies in the world. Um, and we need to make sure that we move forward in a way that helps to build trust and build points of connections. We're not going to agree on everything. But um, the way that I think about this is that the, the most pressing problem in, in the global um, system is climate change. And we're not going to get any real uh, lasting uh, and you know, useful uh, change um, when it comes to how to stop um, catastrophic climate change if we don't have um, some ability to cooperate. And so for that reason alone, I think we need to, I, I, I think the Biden administration will, will change its tactics, won't be quite so uh, you know, bellicose, um, which also just doesn't work because we don't have the kind of power differential to make that work anymore. Um, and it's just not, a, I don't think it's a good um, tactic moving forward. But, um, but in terms of the underlying substance, there are still concerns um, that the Biden administration will carry forward. Great, thank you so much. So, so I see the, the timer ticking down re relentlessly. So this last round will have to be a, a quick fire round with uh, short statements from, from each of you. On I, I think the big question that we have uh, crystallized is how to create rules that preserve uh, cross-border data flows that um, all countries, including China, are interested in, while also preserving data protection privacy as a global concern and the security interests while accounting for the different perspectives, conceptualizations, and bureaucratic structures that countries have to account for these concerns. So that's the big challenge um, for all the stakeholders and for the rule makers. And um, I would invite you to, to weigh in on, on this question before we close the panel. I assume, Thomas, you want me to go first, and uh, I assume you're giving me about 30 seconds. Um, my daughter, who's studying at University International Relations, sent me a text today. She said, Dad, what's the Westphalian state system? Uh, I was meant to answer in three, three words. Um, it, it's not a bad departure point, her question, my daughter's question, because we're in this world of nation states. We have a global economy that is increasingly relying on data for innovation, data for growth. I think Maria said competitive asset, Sarah said innovation. They're absolutely right. There's a global system with nation states at the centre and nation states have got to come together to support that innovation, to support consistency. And that's the only word, consistency and coherence, that I'm going to leave you with. Um, we've got to get the principles right across jurisdictions. Openness is a principle that our government favours. Uh, we've heard a lot about the importance of privacy and, and however we do this, I think, and which in, in whichever forum we try and do it, I think we've got to keep our eye on those big principles. Um, that's a little more than 30 seconds, sorry. 
No problem. Th thanks a lot. Maria, do you, do you have any last reactions to the big questions we are facing? Uh, I think that the, the big question, as, as you formulated it, is an extremely difficult question. Because if you want to have a sufficient buy-in, you're going to need to stay at the level of uh, general principles, as Ambassador Mina was referring to. But at the same time, you you will want to have sufficient ambitious uh, rules, uh, in particular, to tackle the worst forms of protectionism. So there is a little bit of a squaring of the circle there. Uh, we are working and engaging very closely with Australia and the rest of the co-conveners in the WTO economic negotiation efforts. Uh, and, and we are uh, putting all of our effort and priority in, 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 this, in this endeavor. There is a big risk here that I've very few times seen in the past in terms of international rules, which is fragmentation. Uh, a very real risk. Uh, so I do, I do think it's very important whatever we can do uh, to have at least a plurilateral set of rules. Great. And uh, again, well, final reaction as it, well, uh, sure. out of time. Um, I, I do see the clock is ticking, so I'll be really quick. So, um, you know, from, from our practitioner's perspective, I think there's, uh, you know, they, they 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 play to all the regulators always that we needed um you know for the business we needed operationable rules and then that's also clear and also with certainties uh so that's that's one big ask i understand there's a lot of discussions around different concerns and how all, the, all of them can be compatible but that's what business need and in the second very quick point is that um, a lot of time um, what we are facing the challenge here uh, is, is not just because that, you know, companies would like to move data around. It's also because of the, you know, the, the, the fundamental infrastructures of the internet is set up that way. So sometimes that there's no choice. And, and that's also all the a lot of the difficulties that regulators are facing on how to regulate uh, data flow or to segment certain types of data or to sort of, you know, for particular purpose, restricting uh, certain data, they're all, you know, we all have to uh, have certain infrastructure to support that. So that's again becoming operationable. So, so I guess that's that's a big ask for the, all the regulators, and uh, and I'm sure that there will be a lot of conversations going on going forward. Yeah. Great, and, and, and Sarah, what, one last word is, as uh, Asel is pushing us to, to wrap this up. Yes. So I would say two things. One is. Um, I think it's important to understand that different countries are going to want to regulate in different ways. And so let's give, let's figure out how can we give governments more space domestically and what kind of minimally do we need at the international level in order to kind of move forward. So, um, you know, scoping out in a way that is not um, kind of too ambitious in terms of how much we kind of need to do together. Let's um, break apart what we need to do together and what we can kind of leave for um, different societies to kind of come up with rules for themselves. The second thing, again, is trust, right? Kind of that's, I think, the, the big thing here is that in order to cooperate on these issues, as with any others, we need trust among partners. And right now, I think we're operating from a deficit of trust. And so moving forward, I would encourage just um, more and more emphasis on trying to figure out how do we rebuild, how do we build and rebuild that trust among, um, among partners. Excellent. I, I don't want to add anything to this uh, final uh, statement and this call for, for trust. Thank you so much for trusting me in moderating this panel. Thanks so much to, to our panelists. I'm sure everyone who's watching this is, is clapping either virtually or, or physically. And if you want to join us, at least some of the panelists will be able to continue, continue the discussion. Um, you can click on a button below. I, I've been told thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, we are all looking forward to pushing this conversation forward in the future. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.